welcome on this very rainy and dreary day. I'm so happy because we got our, our, our grass laid yesterday. So very grateful for that in the back yard. What's that? And the rain gutters up, and so we have all of our rain barrels are full. So very excited, and the dog was excited. She could play in her backyard, and very exciting. So, and then it rained, and she couldn't. So such is the life of our dog. But anyway, welcome, everybody. To church, Bible stories. Today, David and Bathsheba, and our scripture is this. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. And here are our scriptures today. All right, David and Bathsheba. So David was 30 years old, and he was finally king. After running around in the wilderness for several years, running away from Saul, Saul is dead, David is now king. But he's only the king of Judah at this point. His first capital was at Hebron, where he resided for seven and a half years. And during those seven and a half years, six sons by six different women were born to him. Amnon, Caleb, Absalom, Adonijah, Shephatiah, and Ithream. And of course, next week we'll see how that all turns out. But this week, David and Bathsheba. There was also during that seven and a half years, basically a civil war between the house of David and the house of Saul because not all of sons, Saul's sons were killed at Mount Geboa. The, la- the youngest son was not killed. And so Abner, who was also not killed, tried to make this fourth son, king of Israel. And so there was somewhat of a civil war and fighting back and forth. And finally, both Ishbosheth and Abner were murdered, thus ending the civil war. And so the elders of Israel came to David and said, we want you to be king over Israel as well. So at that point, David is now king of both Judah and Israel, a combined Israel. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem because he was still at Hebron, remember. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. David cannot get in here, they thought. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion and the city of David, and Jerusalem became the capital of city of Israel. And David would reign in Jerusalem for 33 years. Okay, so now he's established, he's the king of a united Israel, he has six sons, he's doing well, he's well established, some time passes, and the Ammonite king, King Nahash, dies. Now, Nahash and David, during the time that he was on the run, developed a relationship. And so when Nahash died, David sent an envoy to the new king to, you know, to express his grief and to share the sorrow of the passing of Nahash. Well, this new king and his advisors were suspicious of David's men. They thought, you know what? They're really here just to see if we're, if, how, how strong our army is, if, you know, if there's some chinks in the armor. They're really here to spy. And so the advisors said to the new king, these guys are spies, 
and we don't trust them. And so Hanan, the new king, took David's servants, these envoys, shaved half their beards off, and cut off their robes to their hips, exposing them. Now, keep in mind that they didn't wear underwear. And so to cut off their robes to their hips, there were some things exposed, shall we say. And this, of course, would have been very humiliating. And then they sent them back home in humiliation. This can only mean one thing as things go, and that is there's going to be some war. Some war is going to happen. And so the Bible says, as our scripture read today, in the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David stayed in Jerusalem. Now, for a man who had spent the majority of his life in battle, fighting, and he was apparently good at it, staying home when your army goes off to war must have been a a hard thing for him. The Bible doesn't say why he didn't go. He just didn't go. And so this fighting man has nothing to do. And I would suggest that he was probably bored out of his mind. And so one night, he goes up on his roof. You all know this story. I'm not telling you anything new. He goes up on his roof. And as he's wandering about, as kings do... He, see, he, glimpses, he glances over the parapet, the edge, of the, wall, the edge of his roof, and there he sees a beautiful woman taking a bath. Now, what should David have done in that very moment? <laughs> run away, David. Just run away. But he didn't. He lingered. And that's when the trouble started. Now, apparently David wasn't alone because he turns to his servant and says, who in the world is that? Now, this this servant was wise because listen to how, how this servant responds. Bathsheba, the wife, the wife of one of your valiant warriors and good friend, Uriah. (laughs) In other words, king, she's married to your friend. (laughs) Walk away. David, however sent for Bathsheba, and slept with her. And you can really consider this situation power rape. She probably had no choice. When the king knocks on the door and says, come home with me, baby, she didn't have a choice. So some time goes by, and... The king gets a little note, says, Dear king, I'm pregnant, sincerely Bathsheba. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. This is not good. So under the guise of wanting to reward Uriah, because, because he was such a good friend, because he was such a valiant warrior, he's at war fighting on behalf of David. So David sends word and says, Uriah, my friend, Bubby, you're so awesome. Come home and spend some time with your wife. Uriah does come home, but he will not go home. He comes back to Jerusalem, but he will not go home. 
His, his, the reason why is because he says, I will not go home to the comforts of my home and my wife while my men sleep in tents. Very honorable. Yeah, John. Of course it is. <laughs> of course it is. David tries everything to get Uriah to go home. He even takes him to the local pub, gets him good and drunk in the hopes that he'll stumble and bumble his way home and do what he needs to do to get David off the hook. But it doesn't work. He tries everything, and Uriah will not go home. And so, finally, David has no choice but to send Uriah back to the war, back to the front. But before he goes, he hands a note to Uriah and says, since you're going back, why don't you take this note to Joab, who was the general of the army? And... Joab got the note and it says, put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. Uriah carried his own death sentence. And Joab did what David told him to do. And Uriah, David's friend, his ally, one of his great fighting men who had wandered in the wilderness with him, died. More specifically, he was murdered by order of his friend. David was relieved. Bathsheba, you can understand, would be devastated. But when an appropriate amount of time passed for grieving, Bathsheba moved into the palace, married David, and a son was born to them. And again, I'm going to read some Ellen White here. As, as time passed, David's sin toward Bathsheba became known and suspicion was excited that he had planned the death of Uriah. The Lord was dishonored. He had favored and exalted David, and David's sin misrepresented the character of God and cast reproach upon his name. It tended to lower the standard of godliness in Israel because if your king is doing that kind of stuff and is getting away with it, why can't I do it? To lessen in many minds the abhorrence of sin, while those who did not love and fear God were emboldened to, trans, to transgression. So, Yahweh sent Nathan the prophet to tell David a little story. And here's the story. There were two men, one rich and one poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds. He was a wealthy guy. The poor man had one little girl lamb. And he loved that little girl lamb. And the, his family loved that little girl lamb. And, and she was soft and cuddly. And they, they cared for her and they loved her. Well... One day, a friend of the rich man comes to town. Not wanting to kill one of his own sheep, the rich man goes to the poor man's house, takes his precious little girl lamb instead and kills her and feeds her to his friend. And David was incensed. He was furious at this story. And he said to, da to Nathan, as the Lord lives, this guy deserves to die. And Nathan says, you, my friend, are that guy. And this is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king 
over Israel. And I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. If all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise my word by doing what is evil in my eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Therefore, the sword will never depart from your house. And out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is closest to you. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. What you did in secret, I will cause to be done for all Israel to see. And we will talk about that next week. And how did David respond? He said, I have sinned against the Lord. And again, got to read Ellen White here. Though there would be found none in Israel to execute the sentence of death upon, upon the anointed of the Lord, David trembled lest guilty and unforgiven he should be cut down by the swift judgment of God. But the message was sent to him by the prophet, the Lord also hath put away your sin and you will not die. Yet justice must be maintained. The sentence of death was transferred from David to the child. Thus the king was given opportunity for repentance, while to him the suffering and death of the child as a part of his punishment was far more bitter than his own death could have been. And we see here this idea of substitutionary sacrifice. We saw it it in Eden. We saw it on Mount Moriah when Abraham said, the Lord himself will provide a sacrifice. And we see it again here, this idea of someone else, something else, paying the price. She also goes on to say, it was when David was walking in the counsel of God that he was called a man after God's own heart. When he sinned, this ceased to be true until by repentance he returned to the Lord. The word of God plainly de declares the thing that David had done was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Though David repented of his sin and was forgiven and accepted by the Lord, he reaped the baleful harvest of the seed he himself had sown. The judgments upon him and upon his house testify to God's abhorrence of sin. And again, we will talk about those consequences which will haunt David the rest of his, the rest of his life, really. We'll talk about that next week. Okay, so what do we do with this story? Well, here's what I got out of it, and you know what's coming, so get your gears working. David saw the enormity of his crime and made no effort to excuse what he had done. It was out of his desire for pardon and restoration that one of the most beautiful prayers of repentance was ever prayed, and that is Psalm 50. One, and it says this, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loyal love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and from my sin cleanse me, for I myself know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, only you have I sinned and have done this evil in your eyes so that you are correct when you speak. You are blameless when you judge. This is, this is an important statement on David's part. He was not blaming God for the, for the judgment that he received. He was saying, I did it. It's my responsibility. It's my fault. You are acting rightly when you are judging 
Behold, in iniquity I, I was born, and in my sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you delight in truth. In the inward parts and in the hidden parts you make known wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and all my iniquities blot out. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and with a willing spirit, sustain me. And then it goes on. David was broken by what he had done. And that brings us to my second point. Some, sometimes people compare the life of David and the life of Saul and wonder how it is that God can forgive David of his horrible sin of adultery and murder, and yet reject Saul for his relatively minor sin of offering a sacrifice and failing to obey God over the Amalekites. And my response to you is that it comes down to how they responded to the judgments of God. David was broken, like I said. He was humbled before God. He confessed his sin. He accepted the consequences. He made no excuses for his behavior. He did not say, well, if she had only not been bathing up on the roof, this wouldn't have been a problem. He took responsibility for his actions. Saul, on the other hand, was defiant. His fist was raised in the air, and he was like, I don't care what you say. And he made all sorts of excuses. The people were running away. Samuel, you didn't come up, show up when you were supposed to. Yeah, they, yeah they, didn't, they didn't destroy everything. They kept the best for you, Lord. He despised rebuke. He hardened his heart. He refused genuine repentance. He was sorry he got caught, but he was not sorry that he had sinned against God. And that's why we have two very different outcomes in the life of David and in the life of Saul. And you can hear David's anguish in Psalm 51. His sorrow for what he had done. and his desire to be restored into a relationship with God. Okay, what did you get out of the, the story of David and Bathsheba? I have a yes, Josh. Yep. The consequence of his sin yep. is his repentance. Uh, what would be the difference? You know, a person who did sin and did not repent and is supposed to reap the consequences. I mean, you get punished either way. <laughs> Right, the, the hope lies in that restoration happened between David and God. Yes, David reaped some pretty sad consequences. And there will be more consequences down the road. But the consequences that you will find happening down the road also have to do with David's choices. Which... which I want to answer your question, but I don't think I can answer it until next week. I mean, if, even, you know, like I, I see it in, in my, uh, like, in dealing with people around me, too, because there are people who are regularly, there are some people whose attitude is like, okay, if I made a mistake, I own up to it and move on. And then there's some people who doesn't want to own up to their mistake, and then they're stuck. 
Yes. And good changes happen in the brain that really aggravate it and frustrate it. When people don't own up to it, when people don't say, I don't make a mistake. Yeah. Well, and that's really where you see that difference between David and Saul. Dave, Saul got stuck. Saul got stuck in his relationship with God because he was like, I, I'm not guilty. I'm not responsible. Somebody else is responsible. And they got stuck. And he, and he just kept repeating, yes. But for David, the most, the most devastating thing about what he did was it, what it did to his relationship with God. That was the thing that he was like, I need to fix this. But he will, he will ultimately make choices that will lead to some pretty serious consequences down the road. And I would, yeah, we're, let me, ask me that question next week because the story of David and Absalom really will maybe answer your question a little bit better. Anybody else? Your, I, your thoughts about David Bathsheba? Yeah, Amy. I have an inkling that Uriah knew. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, and also it may have been God. It's kind of like the, the story of the man of God and the lion just mm -hmm. sitting there with the donkey, not eating the donkey, not eating the lamb, just sitting there all together. Like, or, or the, or the, anyway, like a God thing where it's like, it's not natural. It's just, it's just, um, you know, God taking away the usual urges or the usual yeah. feelings yeah. and just being like, no, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do it. You know? But but I guess I'm saying that number one that. But I felt like when when his his buddies when he I'm sure he was a good guy. When his buddies were told back up, let him die, that must have been heartbreaking for those guys. You know, oh, yeah. to be like, you know, the morale would be like, why are you you know, what in the world? And how could you re how could you respect your king? And that's yeah. and and as Ellen White pointed out, as these as the the information began to trickle out. But you got to know that if your eye wasn't blind, that there was line of sight from the palace roof to the. <laughs> I think I think David probably overplayed his hand when he kept saying to Uriah, like you said, oh. go home. Spend some time with your wife. You know what I mean, winky, winky, winky. Yes. Go ahead, David. Get home to your wife. And Uriah's going, you're a little too anxious yeah. for me to go home and be with my wife. <laughs> yeah. But, but I agree with you, Amy, in that also I think the Holy Spirit was working, saying, you know what? There's no out. I'm not going to live an out now. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, hindsight.
Yeah. It's an extraordinary circumstance. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a hard one, isn't it? It's 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 a difficult one and I am not going to stand here and tell you that I have all the answers. What I do know is that God is good and God is faithful and God is just and he will do the right thing in every situation. And so even if we don't understand why he does something that he does, it seems strange to us, it seems whatever inhuman, whatever word you want to put with it, he did the right thing in that situation. And that's what I know for sure, even if I don't fully understand all the, the reasons behind it. So anybody else? David and Bathsheba. It's an extraordinary story. David shouldn't have stayed home to begin with. He shouldn't have stayed home to begin with. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, you, you can sort of see the progression, right? He shouldn't have stayed home. You know, he's bored. It's okay to go for a walk, but, you know, when you look, glance over and you go, whoa, you, mm -hmm. then you need to turn around and you need to go back in, right? Mm -hmm. you, you see this chain of events that that took him step by step by step to this awful conclusion. So, I don't, I don't even know if we can sing our closing song, but you know what, I don't think we're even gonna try, because it'll take a minute to get it all back up. So, uh, let's stand. <laughs> And let's pray. <laughs>